Hi, Colleen. Oh, I haven't seen Colleen for a while. Colleen was in a prior cohort. Hi. How you doing? And you know what? Did you guys mind muting your mics? Um, I'm hearing a little bit of typing. Um, maybe. Sorry, that was me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're typing your, uh, your, your thing there. I see it. Um, okay. Let's, let's see. Let's make sure we're recording. I think we are. Yep, we're recording. Okay. Let me do a quick little intro. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first design facilitation meeting for our open service MOOC. Yay! We finally can loop all the facilitators in and, and welcome, them, welcome them to the um, to the fold here. Tonight is uh, Thursday, January 7th, 2016, and we'd like to keep this to about an hour. Um, I put a link in the chat room, and I'll put it in there again. This is the PDF we're, um, I'm working off of tonight, so if we don't get to all the, the details, it's kind of uh, a lot to cut through. At least we'll have the opportunity to see what I, I was hoping to get to. Um, so without any further ado, what I want to get to is, um, you know what, I'm still hearing some noise. Um, there, it's better. I don't hear it now. Uh, so I wanna, what I want to get to tonight is um, give get everybody's calendars up to date with some of the really big um, upcoming dates and due dates and things that we've got going on. Uh, give everybody a snapshot overview of how things are going with Canvas and the development of the MOOC within it. Um, and as part of that, I want to make sure that I'm clear on who the, C the SMEs and the facilitators are that are going to be with us. Um, I, had, I think I've got about a pretty much a 70 to 80 percent hit ratio in terms of getting people um, confirmed and up and running. I just have a couple um, that I need to confirm. Then I want to walk through with you what the participants within the MOOC will actually be doing. This is a project-based MOOC, and so um, it's going to be pretty important that we all understand what it is the design project is that the students will be working in. Um, and then I wanted to start adding some clarity to what the roles are for the facilitators and the SMEs once we get the MOOC up and running. Um, by the way, it starts February 22nd. Keep that date in your mind. Uh, and then um, I've been working pretty hard with the OER Commons folks and also the designers to um, come up with what we're going, how we're going to be utilizing that platform for our deliverables. The students will be developing their prototypes and then their final deliverables within an, a, a tool called Open Author, which is part of the OER Commons platform. Um, and then we will also be evaluating their resources using tools that are available on OER Commons. So, um, as I've been kind of joking on the uh, semi joking on that last bullet point there, um, there will be some homework uh, for the next couple of weeks, and it will be mainly. Uh, uh, centered on getting everybody in this group up to speed with how OER Commons works so we can be subject matter experts for our MOOC participants once we get up and running. Um, and then uh, the, the bullet point there I missed is promoting the MOOC. Um, the enrollment for the MOOC begins on Monday, which is Monday, January 11th, and so we'll have quite a flurry of activity probably early next week, getting the word out and spending the next six weeks uh, making sure that we actually have students and participants <laughs> joining our MOOC, so this wasn't uh, um, a wasted effort. So I just want to, I start every session out by thanking people. I don't know how this works. I, I can't explain it, but it does, and it, it, it only works um, because of the wonderful volunteers that we've been blessed to have. I really want to thank you for your time. I know this is, like, as I mentioned earlier, this is taking out of your very important days and your family time, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough and tell you how much I appreciate um, everything that, that you do. Um, and as I said, I've got a lot to cover, and so I could easily become a quick talking head here, talking really quickly, so please feel free either in the chat room or verbally just to interrupt me if um, there's something you want me to go back over or something that I'm not covering. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to plow through here because there, it is kind of a little bit of a brain dump uh, right now with me just giving you a sense of, of where I say things going and things we need to work on. Um, important dates, as I mentioned, January 11th is a biggie. The enrollment begins on Canvas. Um, the design team submitted all their deliverables at the end of December, January, I mean, sorry, December 21st to be specific. And so we are going to have one last hurrah with a design team where they're going to look through the um, Canvas platform once I have everything uploaded and um, all my I's dotted and T's crossed. And so that will be happening on January 15th through the 22nd. Um, and then I'd like to propose to this group that we have a meeting on January 28th. That's three weeks from tonight. Um, so maybe in the text chat, you can let me know if that does not work for you. Otherwise, I'm going to assume it does work. So 7 p.m., it's a Thursday, it's the 28th. Um, that will be our next meeting for this group. 
Um, and then looking ahead to that, uh, a couple days after that, we have a readiness review with Canvas, and they give us the green light to, even though we're enrolling the class, if for whatever reason, I can't imagine by that point we'd have something go wrong, but if for whatever reason they felt we weren't ready, they could pull the plug on us. So it's a pretty big date. I have to have everything done, ready, and pretty for them with a bow on it by February 1st, which then will basically give you guys about three weeks to go through and just, you know, read through all the materials, get a really good solid understanding of what the, um, the Canvas MOOC looks like, how the content's laid out, how the ex exercises and activities work uh, for our implementation that starts January, tw or I'm sorry, February 22nd. Um, and just to remind everybody, this is a 12-week MOOC, so speak now or forever hold your peace if you think there are things that will be coming in your way between February 26th, 22nd and May 15th, um, because we do um, hope everybody can devote, you know, a few hours a week at least to helping us facilitate the MOOC. And if, again, if this seems like it's going to be something you can't handle, speak now. Um, I'd rather address it now than, um, than, than down the road. Um, so here's our facilitators. We have a nice, uh, huge, I, th I say huge, I shouldn't say huge because I don't really don't know what the right number is, <laughs> but we have a nice group of facilitators. I'm still waiting for a couple people to um, confirm, um, but um, welcome everybody as facilitators. I just wanted to call out a couple people. Um, JR and John were on the design team. Stacy was as well. I'm not sure she'll be joining us. Um, and then we have, um, Colleen was on a prior cohort. Um, as a designer with us, and um, Zuen was also, and uh, I think that about, um, oh, Felice was also a designer as well. Yeah, thanks, JR, for reminding me. So we have a lot of folks who are familiar with Designers for Learning, and um, even though none of us have really embarked on something of this scale for Designers for Learning, at least we have a general familiarity with each other and, um, and what our goals and our aims are. From the SME side, things are, to me, a little sparse compared to the other side. We have a, a few um, question marks here. I've, I haven't been able to reach um, Cheryl or um, Lene, and I'm having a hard time reaching them via email, so I don't know what that means. And if they're hearing my words in the recording, um, if you could let me know how things stand. But otherwise, we've got four really strong SMEs that are working with us. And if you know of others who work in the adult basic education field who may want to join us as a SME, please let me know, and, and we may need to tap their, their knowledge and, and ask them to help us if, if it turns out we think we need a few more SMEs to help us once we get things rolling. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's just jump right into how things are going to look in Canvas. Um, as we've talked a couple times, I think this group probably has had um, the opportunity to either catch some of our recordings or talk to some of our designers. It is a project-based course, and, and it will be cu culminating with the development of open educational resources. So the students who are participating, I, got, I have to stop using the word students, let's call them MOOC participants. The people who are participating in our MOOC will be developing designing and developing open educational resources for the benefit of adult educators and learners. Um, and that took us a long time in our design meetings to, <laughs> to get that straight because we have like different learner populations and uh, MOOC participants and different educators and instructors. But what I just said is, is, is the way we're, we're rolling. Um, and so what, what, we're, what we've con constructed within our modules and the, um, the seven modules that are part of our course, it, it, it contains what you would expect it to. Um, there's a certain amount of presentation or demonstration or display of content. Um, and then we have the participants get engaged within um, practice exercises. These are ungraded and not submitted. So the practice exercises would be more what I would kind of think of like a reflection that's not turned in, kind of a prompt to like think about something or try something or do something. Um, then we have group discussions and they would count toward their quote participation grade. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, they also have, uh, it, each module concludes with a designer reflection. Um, and that's, that's submitted but not graded. Um, and then they do have the de deliverables, which are the um, a design, written design plan as well as their final deliverables. And notice I've in parentheses put count toward participation because really except for the prototype evaluation, um, once they turn in their prototypes, it, we will go through a round of formative evaluation. That is really the only thing that you as facilitators and as SMEs will actually help assess. Um, otherwise, all of the work is um, really, it's kind of a did you do it or not as far as the participation scores. And that counts toward, we do, we are offering a service badge. 
um, an instructional design service badge as well as um, a, a certificate for participation. Um, and then in, in terms of Canvas, kind of tying a little um, knot on, and bow on this little piece before we move on, you can expect your access around February 1st. I really don't want a lot of hands in Canvas right now because we are kind of right in that, you know, all hands on deck and, and trying to get all the content in there. And so it'd be best if we just kind of keep things uh, nice and tidy for now, but we'll, we'll, we'll give everybody access right around that February 1st deadline. Um, the designers all have access, but I haven't really opened it up at this point to SMEs or to um, the, the, the other facilitators. Um, any questions now? I'll take like a, a short break. <laughs> I'll take a, a, a pause and just ask, uh, how does this sit? Is this pretty much how everyone thought the Canvas was going to work and what the format of the course was going to be? Okay, well, I'll keep plugging away here and, and please um, interrupt me. So here's a screenshot from what the students will see. It's kind of, um, yeah, it's, it will look a little better than this, but basically they'll, uh, the, the welcome screen will present to them the module zero, which is actually our let's get started, and then the other seven modules. And so they will click on a module or click on the link and it will take them to the module. And let's just spend a moment um, going through what these, um, what these buckets are that they'll see once they click on the link. So it, given it's a project-based course, it's an instructional design course, everything is based around a traditional, quote, design cycle. So we're, we're, we're having them spend some time analyzing, synthesizing, simulating, evaluating, and deciding. Um, and so to drill down on that, so within the analysis phase, within modules one and two, um, the learners are going to spend, um, the, or, I'm sorry, the MOOC participants will spend time um, getting their heads around who the learners are in an adult basic education context. Um, in module two, it's actually a module that um, JR worked on with Stacy. They'll be di diving into the requirements of the college and career readiness standards and then um, doing a deep dive into some of the available free and openly licensed open educational resources that they could potentially adapt um, for, for their own project. So after they've spent time doing that in modules one and two, um, we're calling it like the synthesis phase where they're making their first attempts at generating potential design solutions to meet the instructional design need. Um, and Felice um, designed for us um, a really nice module on um, designing instructional strategies and instructional activities. And it's based on Merrill's first principles as well as what's called the WIPIA um, framework. It's something that's familiar to folks in adult basic education and it looks a lot like Merrill's first principles of it, um, instruction where there's the intro uh, introductory type materials uh, which, which welcome the learners, um, taking them through practice activities and demonstration assessment and then and, um, and finally uh, I can't remember what the last phase is like uh, integration or something like that. I can't remember what it, what it all stand, what they stand for right now. Um, so that's the, that's the synthesis phase. Um, and then the simulate phase is when they're um, actually simulating their design representations. So it will be the written design proposal in module four. Module five is then um, creating a prototype which will be done in OER Commons using Open Author. And we'll spend some time in a moment going through that because that's really where I'd like you guys over the next few weeks to spend a lot of time time getting your head around what the features and, and functionality is of Open Author and o OER Commons because our learners, our MOOC participants, um, will be spending a considerable amount of time once they get to modules four and five um, thinking about how things need to be formatted, how things need to be laid out within, um, within OER Commons using Open Author. And then uh, in the sixth module, we'll be giving um, them the opportunity to experience an evaluation, a formative evaluation. So they will have turned in their prototype in module five into OER Commons as, uh, as, a, as an asset, as an open educational resource. And then JR is actually probably more familiar with this than I am. There is the ability to evaluate the resource. And I, what is it, JR, the Achieve? rubrics is that what it is yeah there's the achieve rubrics and so um, it's something just a button that literally just click on a button that says evaluate and it pops up a rubric and then it has a survey type of uh, setup with little radio buttons and comment features that um, we as well as this peers peer to peer as well as this um, all the SMEs and the facilitators will be able to offer feedback to the um, to the MOOC participants on their prototypes 
And then last but not least is the, um, the final, turning in their final deliverable. Based on the feedback they re receive, we'd like them to go back in and uh, tweak their prototypes to then become the final deliverables. And um, assuming we have no idea how many people will be still with us at this point, but we're kind of throwing around numbers of 10%. So say we get 600 people sign up for our MOOC. We're anticipating maybe we'll get 60 people who will actually complete the course and will have final deliverables that we're going to then be able to store within a separate group that we have on OER Commons. It's called the Adult Learning Zone. And the idea is every time we offer this course that we will get some number of people who have completed their deliverables and will eventually build out a platform of resources that we'll be able to offer up to, um, to adult basic educators and their learners. Um, so that kind of takes you through the seven weeks. It's kind of melding that whole design phase uh, model I showed you along with how the modules are going to function to, to accomplish that. Um, anything, JR? I mean, you're pretty familiar with how things are laying out. Anything I missed as far as giving folks a kind of a high-level overview of, of what the MOOC's going to look like? Speaking is faster than typing. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a, <laughs> uh, I think that's a good uh, overview of kind of the, the flow of the whole thing. Okay. And again, I know I it's have a question. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Hi, it's Amanda. Um, you talked about having uh, having us evaluate mm -hmm. the resources using the achieve rubric. So I was just wondering, are we doing that within OER Commons and providing comments publicly or is it somehow built into the MOOC um, where we'll provide the feedback using the Achieve rubric, but not in the public forum. Well, my my vote, and I can certainly be swayed, is to do it in OER Commons for logistical reasons, as well as you know the stakes are a little bit higher, you know. <laughs> um, but I'd like you know I'd like to hear a counterpoint if someone disagrees that you think it should be something that we keep more within the confines of of Canvas. I get what you're saying about the high stakes. I was just wondering, I guess, what would that look like? So if someone posted or created something in Open Author and we use the rubrics to evaluate it, then they go back in and change it. Are they saving it as a new resource that doesn't have our comment in it or will all future users of the OER be able to see that feedback and then will they in turn know that the resource has in fact been modified um, to kind of bump it up to that, you know, ideal four or three, yeah. whatever the highest um, rating is. Yeah, you bring up a really good point because my idea was that paper trail would kind of be there, but like you're saying, that would affect the overall rating because it would be kind of nice to see the comments to see the okay, yeah, I made the change, you know, or the I, the, the changes were requested and then the changes happened, but I don't know how that would then change the scoring, right? I think you're bringing up a good point. Would that ding them on the score from the prior iteration, right? Unless they did, as you're saying, mod make a that might not be a bad thing to do. What if they did then take it to a new, uh, you know, copy it into a new resource? What are your thoughts on that? If they did copy it to a new resource and we kind of abandoned the other one or del even deleted yeah. the other one? Yeah, I mean, they're really easily deleted in within Open Author, so they could, I guess, remix or revise their own resource and then save it with a different title. I think my my you know, only concern there is that future users are seeing this and they may not um, dig a little bit deeper after they see some of the, the feedback, especially not knowing that it's been modified. So do you think it would be, um, I just so much like the logistics of having, you know, the way they've got it formatted. Do you think it would be a bridge too far to say when you create your new resource, delete your old resource? I mean, it, it literally takes three seconds. Okay. Okay. So good. <laughs> that, I, that would be, I, you know. <laughs> I, I do see what you're saying, because that would really be a shame if we just polluted OER Commons with a bunch of drafts <laughs> that, that were, all, <laughs> you know what I mean, that were ultimately. All right. But I, you know what? Your point is very well taken. And as I'm actually working on that unit myself. So let me think through, because I think I like the idea of let's tell them, create the new resource, delete the other one, um, and, and go with that. 
Any other thoughts on that? And JR, actually, you had a little bit of experience working with those rubrics and the achieve evaluations. Do you think that makes sense that we would ask them to create the new resource and delete the old one? Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. Um, I I haven't actually gone through and and done like a full set because achieve has like six separate rubrics, mm -hmm. and the kind of dipping the toe in the pond activity we have is um, a condensed version of that. So it's a single rubric with the six categories, mm -hmm. um, but it, that's a, a single point rubric that's quite narrative. So it's it's intended for comments more than than a rating scale. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is also available if uh, if the logistics around actually doing this in open author um, end up getting too complicated. Okay. Okay. You know what? This is this uh, this is great. I'm glad you guys brought this up. I will um, I'll go back and revisit this for sure. Um, all right. Very good. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, anything else on that? Okay. Um, oh yeah. Go ahead. Hi, Camille. Speaking, I'm just thinking that I don't think it's going to be like a pollution of OERs because that's what open education is about, sharing what works and what does not work. What about if you have students to just make an appendix of their old submission to show the versioning of their work as to how they've come through the process and then update it with the new version in there? So they have one, it's going to be a larger file but it's going to show how they've progressed from one version to the other, which is a great learning tool given the field and given what we're teaching. Yeah. And that is kind of what I was saying before. I kind of like that paper trail, the virtual paper trail to see um, how things were revised. Uh, yeah. So maybe ask them to just put it in an appendix. Okay. And you know, or if I can... a version or whatever of that same document and then, yeah. Okay. Let's let's think through this. That again. actually. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That that actually works on OER Commons really well because you can remix or revise things that are created in Open Author, and then see you can cite. Um, you know, you can just say like remix or revised from and provide the link, and I think they all actually allow for that space right in the resource, so it will be very easily archived. Okay. And so that would pull over the other content as well. You think it will also pull over the, the re reviews or, or just the content? Well, my understanding is that it's not going to pull over the original material into the new material, but it will cite and provide a link to that original material. So someone might want to go in and look back and see what was the original. Oh, okay. So this would that. Okay. So, you, so how do we feel about that, that we're keeping – prior versions in there is that a pro do you think that's a problem because because does the old version it doesn't link to the new version it's just the new version links to the old version right correct that's my understanding okay so do you think that's a problem if we leave a bunch of <laughs> kind of dead artifacts that we moved no, I, don't, I don't think so okay okay well, i don't think so it's open education and i think that's what i mean mm -hmm. yeah. that's what people look for the progression Okay. You know what? And, and when in a moment I'm going to, in, the, in my quote homework that I'm giving everybody, one of the opportunities is to go ahead and create resources. So maybe if you guys could help me out and think through this by when you're going in and, and trying out or open author, just see how you think this will, what the, the workflow would be. Um, but great, great points. And thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so now let's still dive into the actual roles for the facilitators and the SMEs as I envision it. Um, for the facilitators, I really see two different components to the role, one being the informal and the other being the formal. So the informal, um, we've all had the opportunity, I'm assuming, to participate in some way, shape, or another within a MOOC. They can be very cold, uh, usually very content heavy. Certainly ours is very content heavy, um, largely self-guided. And so the in informal part of that I'm really um, you know, reaching out to you guys to help me do is to really make this um, an enjoyable and worthwhile service learning experience for people. So to add the personality to the MOOC, to be the eyes and ears, trying to just see if people are finding their way, if they're lost. And as every, any, any of us who've taught online, you can tell pretty easily when the discussion forums start you know, getting weird questions. Or we, we have a help forum, and we're also going to have an Ask the Expert forum, um, as well as then the discussion forums we have for each of the modules. Um, so 
you know, that's the part that's kind of hard for me to, to necessarily qualify right now, what, what that will look like. But um, it, it's more just <laughs> kind of going back to your roots as, as educators and teachers. You know, you can kind of tell when things are starting to go south. Um, so, you know, certainly elevate things to me or just take the initiative if you see someone looks like they're really lost and have no idea what they're doing or they're going down the wrong path or whatever it may be. Um, you know, that's something that can usually be nipped pretty quickly within a, you know, reply to a discussion post or whatever it may be. Um, now, on the formal side of things, there are certain things that we're kind of committing to the part MOOC participants that we'll do. Um, and one of those is, is to be true moderators within the discussion forum. So we have prompted questions and things we're asking them to do. And um, they may actually th be, you know, would appreciate our feedback and maybe even asking some um, for, for guidance on certain things. And so that's something that, you know, I'm asking everyone to help me do. And we'll talk probably more in the next session when actually you're able to go into Canvas and see thing, how things are laid out. Because I would like to talk as a group how logistically we're going to do this and as far as like who's going to work on what or who's going to be responsible for moderating which dis discussion form things like that and, and once we have um, the ability to look at canvas i think that will be a little bit easier to do and um, and then also as we, we were just talking about the formative ev evaluation piece um you know i really would like us all to commit to making sure whoever submits um, a, a prototype for us that we really do take the effort to give them feedback. So e even if it's a matter of like one facilitator and one SME, um, ha give them the, the feedback on their module. I think that would be great. Um, and then otherwise, as I mentioned, there's really not a much we were, we were doing in the way of assessing their work. So the other things then we would be doing would be more, more monitoring the help forums, asking an expert. And then I'm actually going to just ask JR maybe to, to step up and, and give some thoughts. Right now, as the, this, as the MOOC is designed, we don't have any scheduled live Google Hangouts, um, but it's something that we've been toying with uh, throughout the design process. And JR, I think you had the idea of maybe making it a little more ad hoc where they're not necessarily scheduled, but we would either maybe do as a, you know, a, hey, would anybody like to hang out on Thursday at seven o'clock? I'll be in such and such hangout room. But do you want to kind of um, elaborate on that a little bit? I think that's kind of the, <laughs> like exactly what I was thinking is that it, either topic based on, on which topic is, is happening that week and scheduling sometimes. I know some of the closer to CMOOC things um, have done kind of um, two lecture series. So ET MOOC had, um, I think, kind of like a morning and evening sort of thing to span all the different time zones that they they had um, and it was like the same the, the meeting held the same purpose both times um, so that was one idea that had crossed my mind um, and always open to, to different suggestions as well um, it, it's something where if it's going to be later in the week of course you know give several days notice but um, you know we have either the space available or uh, our Google Hangouts I think can accept 12 plus one if they're still have if they still have that size mm -hmm. yeah and um uh, clean's bringing up a good way to kind of phrase it you think of it like at office hours um where you know we could maybe in, i'm thinking i originally was saying not making it formal but maybe if we did kind of have like think of it in an office hours concept where uh, maybe like you said thursday morning and thursday afternoon whoever wants to show up um would have the opportunity to do that and that's one thing we've done in, in prior cohorts as well as we, we, and I haven't really thought through a way to do this, um, but we had like a Q&A type forum. So if you, you have questions that you'd want to bring up in the MOOC, but you maybe can't, or I'm sorry, in the live session, but you can't be there, at least you had the opportunity to post your questions. And maybe that's what really what we would use the ask the expert um, thing to do. Um, let's see if it's difficult for one person to host it could rotate. Yeah. So let's, let's table this for right now, but let's think through it. And now that we've kind of raised this as a, I think something we want to do. Um, let's kind of move on right now, but, but definitely let's circle back on this on the 28th and, and think through how we want to do these, um, do these hangouts. Okay. Very good. And then the SMEs. Um, oh, oh, oh yeah. Kitchen parties. I love Rick Schwer. He's awesome. 
anything he does. I will, I will steal whatever he, <laughs> whatever he does and whatever he calls it. So for the SMEs, um, uh, similar to the, the facilitation role, but um, not necessarily as much um, responsible for the hands-on of, of making sure the, the, the trains are running, but really being there to help and monitor to the inquiries that come in. We have, as I said, an ask, the ask an expert forum. And so I anticipate questions will be coming in there as well as um, just questions that are going to be arising in the, in the discussion for the weeks that we're doing. And um, as I said before, I think this is, for anyone who's ever done a discussion forum, I've personally never done one for 600 people though, I guess. <laughs> but, um, you know, you can tell when you need to jump in and, and when you kind of need to step back a little bit and let, let things happen and conversations happen. But um, I think that there will be a tremendous amount of opportunity for you, you, you see something that prompts you to say, oh, I can give you a resource you might be interested in, or there's something you may want to contemplate that you haven't. And that kind of falls again in that more of that gray area, that, that informal role that you would be doing. Um, but I, I definitely think that would be something that you'll be able to see as the course progresses and as those module discussions um, start happening. And then certainly we would love your participation if we end up going forward with these ad hoc, ad hoc um, Google Hangouts. I think that would be great. Um, so now let's just jump right into it. We've got about 30 minutes left, and um, hopefully I won't talk at you this whole time, but um, this is really where I want for the next three weeks for you, really, for you, if you could do a deep dive into OER Commons and really get an understanding of how things are laid out there and how we'll be utilizing some of the features they have. Um, and so here I even put in capital letters important. Um, so if you could spend some time thinking through how the learners or, or the MOOC participants are going to find resources, not necessarily always on OER Commons, but using this as kind of our home base for a lot of what we're going to be working on. So how that process is, as Amanda was talking about before, that you can remix existing content. So spend some time playing around seeing how that happens, how the open author um, tool works, um, how the, this, the uh, MOOC participants will be able to share their resources within the confines of what we're calling our adult learning zone group. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, how that evaluation process works, how those rubrics um, kind of guide that evaluation process and how you actually um, provide your feedback. And, um, and then also how the, 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 the MOOC, participant, MOOC participant might receive that evaluation feedback from their resources. A lot of the stuff that we were just talking about with Amanda and, and Camille and others. So the reason I'm saying the OER Commons is important is because I, we're touching on aspects of OER Commons in four out of the seven modules. So in module two, when they're going out finding and evaluating OER, developing their prototype, they'll be developing an OER Commons, the evaluation, and then the final deliverable. Um, so here are a couple of videos that I have come across. They were actually created, nothing that I did, but they are from the people at OER Commons, uh, behind OER Commons, the nonprofit behind it. Um, the first is very simple, like how do you create your profile? All these videos are about two to three minutes long, so it's not huge, but this probably would be a good place to start to watch these videos, and the links are shown here um, at the bottom of each screen. Um, here's our, our OER Commons group. Um, the OER, I'm sorry, the adult learning zone designers that were part of our design team in the fall, we looked at a lot of different options, and unfortunately some of the really cool options uh, come at a fee, and this is free. So you may find when you're poking around on the sites that there are hubs and microsites, and trust me, we wish we could have done that, done that, but we couldn't do it right now. They, they do come at a pretty hefty price tag that we, we don't have the budget for right now. So we are relying on this group feature. Um, so please, over the next three weeks, spend some time. I sent an invite. Um, I'm not sure if you received, if you've checked your email in the last 15 or 20 minutes before we started, but I did invite everybody that's um, I'm a facilitator and a SME to join our group um, and then the Adult Learning Zone group on OER Commons. So you should be able to then go to this place and then play around and see how things are stored and how things are tagged, things like that. And then also, um, if you want to... Is the group going to be private? Is this, the, is that Amanda? Yes. Yeah, you know what? I'm starting it private, and I don't know. I, I'd like your thoughts on that. What, what do you think of that? I was going to have it where it was, you, you had to request um, an invite rather than just getting the world for the purposes of our course. But what do you think? No, I think that's fine. Okay. I think it will be easier for the facilitators, and then you can always very easily just make it public so other people have access 
to it. Okay. Yeah, that is the like afterwards. Okay. Yeah, right now it is closed and it has the ability that someone can request to join and then we can, you know, verify that they're part of the class and let them in. So, and if that becomes too cumbersome, if, depending on how many people we have, you know, maybe we'll, we'll have to <laughs> that. But um, so if you do have any questions on how groups function, again, here's a little video you can you can uh, watch on that. Um, here's open author. And um, so the way you find it is once you log in, as I show right there, you, if you click that create, um, on the menu bar, it will take you to this page and you click start authoring and it will take you right into it. There's also, a, it's a pretty helpful yet short video on how to use OER, uh, open author within OER Commons. And then once you are into the actual um, OER, or open author rather, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> if you've ever used Google Docs, you will have no trouble using um, open author. In fact, you ha have a, a really nice feature if you do create something within Google Docs and you want to import it, it's really a very easy one-click upload. Um, so what basically what you can do in Open Doc, I'm sorry, what you can do in Google Docs, you can do in Open Author. So you can obviously create text, but then you can also do some degree of embedding of images and, and videos and linking to things. Um, and then, so what this, there's, if you look along the top there, there's, it says write and then describe and submit. So once uh, the content is present, uh, presented the way you want it to, then you click over to the next, you hit click next step describe, and it will take you to this screen. And this is the um, really the ability to set up all the parameters for searching. So what subject matter are you covering? What's your audience and things like that. Um, and again, once you're in there, you'll see all the different prompts that, that you have the ability to go through and select and some are required and some are optional. And then finally on the submit page, it's where you make your selection in terms of what copyright you want. Everything on OER Commons is a Creative Commons, I believe, at least when you use OER, um, I'm sorry, when you use Open Author. And so these are the last little selections you make before you um, finally publish your resource. And then, um, as I mentioned, the evaluation piece of it, there's also a video to watch for that, which will kind of, it does a nice job. I think it's about a six minute video on how that, um, the rubrics and things that we were just talking about, how that process works. Um, so that's all I had as far as getting ready for you to be able to, it's about as much as I guess I can talk about until you guys can actually touch the, uh, touch the MOOC and, and play around within, uh, within Canvas. But any questions or anything that's really fuzzy of what I've say what I've said so far? All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep keep plugging away here. So the uh, but the big thing on our, my agenda, at least next week, is, um, is starting the ball rolling for promoting the MOOC. We have um, the, we'll probably have a huge um, blast in, in on Monday and Tuesday. And when I say huge, I suppose everything is relative. But we have about 800 people on the Designers for Learning email distribution list, which we'll certainly use. Um, and then um, I'm just really looking for people to help me blast things on social media. So if there are um, groups on Facebook or on LinkedIn, some instructional design or adult basic education groups that you may use. Um, I know we certainly have other um, links and forums. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know what? That's great. Camille, hang on a second. It's right here. Can you, can you click or see that? I wonder if I can highlight that real quick. Here, here you go. Here's the link. There you go. So this is the, that, the link that I just shared right now is to our website because there isn't a place on Canvas yet for our course. That will be there on Monday. Um, so if you click on um, that link that I just put in the chat room, it takes you to our website. And then, um, if I can again, let me share, do a different share. Okay, hang on a second. Okay. Can you guys see my website? Or yeah, the the designers for learning. Yeah, one. perfect. Yeah, okay. So this is the page I was just referencing. So this gives it's basically like a frequently asked questions about the MOOC, and it, it just goes through and says what what is the course course focus, what are the costs, the prerequisites, and what have you. And then the very top up here, it says enrollment begins on January 11th. If you click on that, it will take you over to Canvas. And um, yeah, okay. So Camille, I think goes to that question, Jen. I mean, do you have specific verbiage exactly? I was, was thinking you know, in my mind. Do you have 
specific things that it's something we should say uh, or just post the link? Um, that's a good question. Well, I will certainly have a, the blast that I'm giving out. I guess it's going to depend on your audience. So what, what I usually do is on my formal email, and you'll certainly all get a copy of that. It's, it's, it's kind of geared toward who I think would might be reading it. So on the emails, it tends to be faculty and students and instructional design programs. So I think I'll probably phrase it that way, like a couple paragraphs uh, directed both to a faculty audience and a, and a student audience. But certainly then I think when you're in LinkedIn or whatever, it may just be easier to have a couple, two or three sentences that are pertinent to that group and then just put in the link. Um, so does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Just because I think our audiences are going to be yeah. kind of across the board here. <laughs> mm. And then I don't know, maybe some of the sub subject matter experts can help me out a little bit here. I'm very dialed into the instructional design community, but I'm not nearly as dialed into the adult educators. So any thoughts on how we can do a better job at reaching them? I'm, I'm thinking, Jennifer, I'm thinking your last sentence of your first paragraph Going mm -hmm. into your second paragraph is a good introduction to the course. Okay. I'm thinking also, I don't know if you have a succinct name for the course. That's been kind of a tongue twister. I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> really, I think yeah. we're calling it an uh, open, uh, instructional design open service MOOC, but uh, I'm open to suggestions on that as well. Yeah, so I think I that's mean, if you can add... Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, if you can add something about adult education in there, I think you'll hook in the teachers a little quicker. Okay. That is so funny because I just had it. I had this whole thing reviewed today by uh, some friends of mine that are instructional designers, and they made me put on instructional design and take out, <laughs> take out adult education. So <laughs> I think it's going to be a matter of like who we're. Uh, so okay, let me let me continue to, <laughs> to work on that. I think I've changed that. Where it says join our free instructional design service MOOC, I think I've changed that forty five times today alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so we'll keep working on that. So well, you're so going to send the, we, the language to us. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. What were you? Go ahead, Amanda, what? No, I was just asking, you're, you're going to send the language to us that you're sharing with others, and then we can tweak it to share um, with the adult ed audience? Yeah. Yep, and so okay. so all of you guys are on my, um, my main blast, so you'll get my email that will be what I've sent out to our distribution list. If you choose to use that language as you know, parts of it for what your purposes are, that would be great. But everything will be kind of, will definitely be linking back to this page that I shared right here. Um, Cause this really goes through all the nuts and bolts of, of the course, how to register what the expected time commitment, things like that will be. Um, so does that, does that okay, work out? Great. This is kind of our home base for the promotional materials, I guess. Um, okay, so I'm I'm going to be selling it overseas to a bunch of people, and to do that, I need they need like two sentences, the name of the book, where to register, because they're not going to read past right. what it's about, <laughs> why we should do it, all of that. Okay, so um, so then you, what you'll have actually, I wonder if even it's there. If you right click on that where it says enrollment begins January 11th. I think mm -hmm. you should see the link that will be, I mean, I wouldn't do it until Monday till we can verify this, but that should be the link that will take us directly to the canvas page for the enrollment. It's supposed okay. to, be. that's the plan. But like I said, until it's live on Monday, I can't confirm that. But like if you right click, what happens for you guys, if you guys want to try it, if you click on that enrollment begins January 11th, does that, for me, it doesn't work because it's just a long it's, command. Uh, but. It's asking you for your email. I can put it in and see what it does. Earlier today, it was just kind of a dead end, but I'm not sure. I'm just going to pretend I, I have some kind of a Canvas net login, but I'm just going to be a new user from now on. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. It's actually opening up the form. I agree to the terms. Enroll in the course. It's somehow enrolling me in which way, I don't know. But it's really enrolling me um, in some kind of a role. It's taken me all the way into a blue button where it's going to, if I click it, it's going to enroll me in the course. I, I'm all not right. sure. Do that. Maybe, maybe we're live. Maybe, maybe it's live. 
It looks like it is live. So okay. the dashboard's open, uh, calendar's open, inbox is open, some kind of an account. Um, I'm not sure what the courses mean, but there's some some things are open on the on the left panel there. Okay, so we're getting there. Well, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. So hopefully by and JR is saying he can't find it on the, the site itself as far as the uh, front page, but. Yeah, and Canvas sent me an email right now. It's just saying, click here to finish the registration. It's wanting me to register. Okay, well, that's good. So, yeah. Camille, does that work for you then if you just use that link um, and then your own verbiage that you want to use for, uh, for, the, for the purposes of your email? Does that work out? Camille? Oh, I saw you. I I, I muted myself. Yep. That's okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, okay. Well, so let's... Today, go ahead and enroll in this course or, or is there another uh, role that this facilitator we're going to have that going in as a, yeah. kind of different, a student role, admin role, whatever role. Exactly. So on my end, um, I'm going to have to go in and then I will have to put your email in and do it. So you, yeah, you're right. Right now you're just enrolled as a student, but I'm going to have to go in and kind of override that to, uh, to make you, you know, I'm, I'm not going to continue this process. Okay. I'm going to leave okay. it right here and then you just fix what you need. Okay. To. Well, thanks for doing that though. Cause as, as of earlier today, we couldn't even get as far as you're getting. So okay. they must be doing something behind the scenes yeah. to, uh, to get us up and running. Okay, let me um, stop sharing this and go back real quickly to our PowerPoint. But I think I'm just about done with what I had to um, um, to talk at you. Um, so yeah, as I said, some homework. If you guys could please just go through those videos we talked about, play around on OER Commons, and uh, please, as you're doing tonight, it's it's great. Uh, we're trying to uh, contemplate everything, but certainly we're going to have a lot of gaps as we really start digging into things. So really from now until February 22nd, the more we can try to work out some of these kinks of, of how things actually will work when we have live participants, um, the better. So keep, keep the questions and comments coming. I really appreciate that. Um, anything else um, that... You, well, you it talk looks about. like there'll be a course there when the when the it's not like you're gonna turn on the key and then there's nothing live. It looks like <laughs> something's gonna happen, so it's very positive at this point. So, and then you know, since we do have like one or two minutes, uh, maybe to talk about this, um, Amanda and I actually had the opportunity today. Um, I got a little nervous yesterday because all of our eggs are so uh, in the OER Commons basket. And so I've been reaching out to the, we have a contact there to make sure that what I'm trying to do actually we can do within their system and that they're not for some reason going to turn off open author tomorrow or something crazy like that. And so they confirmed, yeah, that'll be stable through the, through the May 15th at least. And, and all those other questions I had. Uh, but one, one uh, sticking point we have is unfortunately the, college and career readiness standards, which are the basis for um, adult basic education, they are not yet loaded into OER Commons. And it's not a matter of them not wanting to, it's just a matter of the, the databases are, have not been produced to allow them to do that. Um, and so that's something kind of a longer vision and, and Amanda and I hopefully we'll get that ball rolling in February. So as you're going through OER Commons, you are not going to see a reference for college and career readiness standards, which is an unfortunate thing. I wish I could say it's there, but it, we thought it might be ready in time, but it's not going to be. So all of the resources that are created um, won't have that great perfect alignment to um, to the standards that we're, we're designing our instruction for. But Amanda, any thoughts on that? Do you, I mean, you guys had to already do a project like that before. Was that a big hiccup for you on your other project? Are, are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, not really. Um, partially because it was not part of the requirement of the project that they, you know, make note of it. But as I'm like listening to you and thinking about it, there are a lot of other options that we can be creative with. And I don't know if it's too late, um, but you can comment when you're doing the evaluations on the entire resource. There's a comment box and you can also make comments individually for each of the rubrics. So it, we may want to encourage people to add whatever standard it's aligned to. Mm -hmm. um, in one of those comment boxes or even as they're adding key terms to make note of like, you know, put CCRS reading one or some, something like that. 
yeah. um, where we could still identify what it's aligned with without having that kind of formal identification right. through OER Commons. Yep, and and, and J, yep, JR just wrote in here the abstract. That's that's where we're asking them to uh, make sure that it references that it's CCR, CCRS aligned. And then we also, what we're terming an, um, an instructor guide, it's very brief, but it, it just lays out what the topic is, what the subject is, those types of things. And the CCR will actually, the, the whole anchor standard will be written out and, and you know, described. Um, but as you're saying, unfortunately, it's not going to be part of the indexing necessarily, except for the keywords. You bring up a good point too. If maybe we can think through a way to prompt them to even just put CCRS or something like that within a keyword, um, maybe then that will give us a fighting chance in the future to be able to, to, to go back through. And there, oh yeah, short code, there are, um, yes, there are. There are citation codes. Um, that's a really good point. That's a very, very good point. And I think that's what you're talking about, JR, right? Within the standards where each, at the end of the descriptor for each standard, it has that citation. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think Stacy yeah. Stacy did that section. And uh, I remember like it, it's like five or six characters, but um, yeah, if we could use those as keywords, that might be interesting as well. Okay. Okay. And a lot of this will make more sense when you play it around with it, so. Okay, well, I've got eight minutes to go, and I'm, I think I'm out of, I'm out of stuff. So <laughs> anybody else want to raise any issues that I may have forgotten or anything? Okay. Okay, speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, and then just to tie a little bow on what we talked about before but that we turned the recording on, um, we do have the opportunity to do some AECT proposals. So if you are interested in that, um, it was in that last email I sent out. There's a link to take you to the Google Doc to start working on that. I know um, Kaya and um, Camille are going to collaborate on a proposal. Camille brought up a great point. That shouldn't be the, our, our only game in town. There's certainly a lot of um, conferences that we may want to um, consider participating at. So always keep that in the back of your mind if, if there's a conference you want us to consider um, or you want to propose something that would be aligned with what we're doing here on this project. Certainly raise your hand and, and we'll try to get that done. Amanda and I are going down to Texas actually in April to do a, a presentation at COEB. So that's one example. Well, thanks everybody so much for joining us tonight. Um, and we'll see you in three weeks. Good night, gentlemen. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.